Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa out at the North Shore. Today, I think we have a topic that will interest everybody. It's teaching, specifically the joy of teaching. And I think it's going to interest everybody because we're all teachers and we're all students. Can't go through life without teaching somebody something, and you can't go through life without learning something from somebody. So uh, we're going to be talking about that and specifically about the joy that teaching brings. And with me today is my good friend, Greg McDonald, who is a teacher uh, like myself, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. Greg, welcome. Good to have you back again. Thanks. Now, Greg, you know, this has been a very difficult time, not with not only with COVID, but everything else. Uh, with our economic problems and everything. And uh, teaching has always been hard to do and not that much money involved. Uh, and yet, despite all the difficulties, teachers keep on teaching. And uh, I think that's because they find joy in it. So that's a good place for us to start. If you can tell us a little bit about why uh, that joy that you get from teaching keeps you going and teaching year after year after year. Well, I think my answer is probably a little bit egotistical and selfish, but uh, basically, I just like uh, I like having an audience. I, I should have been an actor on a stage, but I took acting in high school and kept throwing up before my part to go on stage. And I thought, OK, I, I don't want to do that. Um, but then later, as I as I got older and started teaching, I thought this this is cool. And then, you know, I'm a musician, too. So you have an audience. And I sometimes tell people that what I what I like about both is that in some ways I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing something in front of a group expecting some kind of a response. In one case, I'm putting out a psychological, uh, you know, um, information to students, and the other ones I'm putting if, uh, musical information out to an audience. But in in both, I'm expecting some kind of input, some kind of exchange. I just like being able to have have that. I guess I'm kind of a, a ham. So that's that's why I hang in there. And and I'm probably, without telling you my age, I can give you a way to figure it out. I'm about 10 years past the normal retirement age, and I don't need to be teaching. And I sometimes tell my students, um, don't don't tell the administration, but I would teach you Amy, because I have fun. And I think that's probably the simplest answer for me about uh, the joy of teaching is I just have fun. And, and I think maybe I saw that with some instructors that I had. Most of them just taught. <laughs> and some of them seemed to be uh, having fun and laughing like it was play for them. And that's, that's, that's what it is for me. But I also, I also think of um, a One Twilight Zone episode. This is, this is another reason why I enjoy teaching. The Twilight, this Twilight Zone episode told me something. After many years of teaching, you sometimes are going to ask the question, did I make any difference to anybody? Because you never see them again. And the saying is, you hope you impacted one person out of the class, you know. And... In this episode of Twilight Zone, it's about a re it's about an old professor who's forced to retire, and he comes back one night to clean out his room. This is the way classrooms looked probably in 1930 or 40, you know, small wood and all that kind of stuff. And as he was cleaning out, the ghosts of students of his who had died for one reason or another, some of them died in war, some of them died from disease, but they died from various reasons. And he, as he looked up each one, he would go, oh, my gosh, I remember you. And that student would quote something that the teacher had said that he never forgot. Now, this teacher was a literature teacher. So he was teaching like Shakespeare or Thoreau or stuff like that. And each of those ghosts had learned something that helped them through their whole life. And I thought that that was an amazing episode. And it made me feel like, yes, whether we get any direct feedback or not, people remember stuff years later. And that's another that's another joy of teaching, I think, that somewhere along the line there's a difference. Oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I just saw the uh, headlines in today's um, 
you know, on the internet that Tina Turner had passed away. Yeah. And um, she was, uh, the same thing works with entertainers, musicians, everybody that has an impact on us. Uh, it may be different, but uh, thinking about her, it was like seeing her ghost and listening to her and listening to her sing. And uh, it brought back, well, tears to my eyes because uh, she gave something to me. And I think the teachers, like you're saying, on the Twilight Zone, uh, as illustrated on Twilight Zone, give something to people. And sometimes they don't realize it. Sometimes when you're a student, uh, it's only years later that you think, where did I get that from her? Oh, yeah, I remember it was in so-and-so's class. And uh, it didn't seem you know, powerful at the time, but it turned out to be very powerful and something that stayed with them. And, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I'd like to talk more about how some teachers uh, inspired you a little later, but right now I'd like to talk a little bit about the students, because one of the things I notice about students, and I was hoping you could uh, tell us about what you noticed, was that students are different. There's in class for different motivations. Some are there because they are not sure where they're going in life. And uh, they're just sort of following after high school. And that's sort of they sort of wind up in college for some reason. But they haven't found out the path that they're going to take. Some students have got a pretty good idea of the path. Uh, but they're not that much interested in what I'm teaching so much as the credit I'm giving them for the class because it's going to give them a diploma. And wherever they're going to wind up, they're going to need a diploma. So they're the diploma seekers. And then finally, there are the students who think they've got an idea of maybe going in the direction of the subject that I'm teaching. And so they want to learn as much as they can about it. And specifically, they want to learn how to be good at that. Um, so three real different types of students. And uh, I found it always a challenge to be able to satisfy or to help all three different kinds. So I was going to ask you uh, your thoughts on that and how you manage to reach uh, a lot of different students who wind up in your class? I, I never divided them the same way you just did in, in three categories. I could only think of two. And the two were those that want a ticket punched and those that are seeking some kind of degree or knowledge. But um, it was fun to think of the third type as well. Anyway, I ran into that here teaching in Hawaii, especially in community college, because there are so many different mm, ethnicities here. There are students from foreign countries here. Um, and uh, a lot of them were probably like me when I went to community college, which was uh, to get my ticket punch. No, it wasn't, wasn't even that. I went to college because that's what my friends were doing and I wanted to hang out with them. So that, that's, a, that's even another of the reasons why, okay? So anyway. When, when I started realizing that as an instructor, that holy smoke, you know, I've got some great students in here first to talk and they, you know, they could practically quote the text back and other ones who are having trouble staying awake, right? And it bugged me for a while, but I think the quick answer to that so that I don't default to rambling is... Um, I decided that I would always teach to the highest level and not try to teach to all the levels of, you know, that you mentioned, the ones that, you know, are maybe lower, maybe they don't have as much motivation and so forth. And the reason is this, I, I, the, I want to teach at the highest level because I want to put out, I just want to raise the bar. It's, it's like at the Olympics, you know, when, when, when guys are practicing for the high jump, they don't put the jump low so that they can make it. They put the they put the bar higher, knowing that most of the time during practice they're going to knock it down. But it makes them try harder, so they got further. They got more, and something about that struck with me that I'm always going to teach to the highest level. Now, that's going to create a problem for some students that can't possibly reach that level. And so I tell them in my orientation that this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to be teaching to the highest level. And if you find that you can't make it, let me know as soon as possible. And I'll try to work out something for you that would be helpful. 
But as far as being in class, I'm always going to be talking to the highest level. So I offer those that aren't going to do very well an alternative to work with me. Sadly, they never take me up on the alternative, which tells me they're not that motivated anyway. Um, and then I joke with the students who are really smart. And after the first quiz we take in the second or third week, just so they can kind of see how the quizzes are, uh, I tease the A students. And I say, if you got an A on the quiz, you don't belong in this class. You belong in a class that's more difficult, meaning one that will push you because you're already easily getting A's. But I tease in that way. I don't say it with some kind of grimace or threat, right? I just tease, oh, you know, if it's that easy, you should consider uh, a more difficult section. So that's that's my answer to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it's not quite that simple. I mean, I know Greg pretty well, and we've been together for and talking about this subject for many years. And he does things like those Twilight Zone episodes. He'll illustrate what he's saying. He doesn't just talk or do the old style uh, professor at the blackboard who writes at the blackboard and you only seen their back for the whole class, uh, which drove me crazy from those type of teachers that I dealt with. Greg's out there talking to everybody and making it personal and illustrating it with things like the Twilight Zone or other clips from other movies, our art, our music, our, um, and I think Greg uh, really is an example of a teacher who performs, and performers grab your attention, and I think that that's uh, a, certainly a strength in, uh, in mm -hmm. teaching. I mm -hmm. think that if more teachers performed, um, you know, we would reach a lot more students, but unfortunately, like I said earlier, teaching is a hard job and it's a lot of work. And uh, a lot of people just think, well, the teachers just show up and talk to the students and they don't even consider the amount of time and preparation for doing what you need to do, yeah. which is is pretty phenomenal. I, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, <clears throat> before the program gets too short, because we only got a half an hour, is the one thing I found really interesting about teaching is that while you teach, you learn. And so I wanted to ask you, Greg, about that, how you felt about, uh, the, you know, if you felt similar to the way I did. Because every time I teach a class, uh, I learn from that. I learn something new in teaching it. Um, and in fact, the first time I taught a class, you know, they said in college, they said, well, we need you to teach this. And I said, well, I've never taught that before, but I'd like to give it a try. Had it in, you know, as a student. And I learned a lot about it. I think I know a lot about it. And I found that once I started teaching it, I didn't know very much. <laughs> and uh, as I taught it, I learned so much more and it got embedded more. It became part of me rather than something that's just sort of up here running around with uh, all the other facts that I learned in, in college, but it really sort of internalized. Um, and so I was wondering how you felt about the fact that we're, uh, it's a lifelong learning experience to teach others. I don't know, uh, is that what you found? Well. What you said, yes, I yeah, I would agree with what you said. But when I was thinking about the, the topic about how I learned from them, I fell across a slightly different going. I took it in a slightly different direction. Uh, one one of the things that I fell across several years ago to get them more motivated was and to. Uh, get kickstart the class is that in every class, the first thing we did was break into small groups of about four. And um, it, the written assignment for the week was always, um, what did you think, feel like, or not didn't like about the information, your assigned information, which is usually a text, okay? And uh, at first I had to explain to them that your opinion isn't regurgitating a fact. Like in the beginning, they might say some. They might do a paper. They might give their opinion, and it would be like, "Well, uh, Freud said there was three parts to the personality," and um, and and then they would define that. And I say that that's 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 not your opinion. I want to know what your opinion is. So I have found that drive more and more. I drive students to what's your opinion because I want them to think about it. I don't want them to get the idea that I'm looking for a correct answer. 
I tell them, I'm not looking for a correct answer. I'm looking for some, you may never remember some of these topics, but the more you can exercise what do you think and feel or question about what we're doing, that will serve you the rest of your life. So I pushed that group. Now, the group I later found, this is, this is an answer to your question, how do I learn something back? That was obviously designed for them. But then I decided, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, after the group is over, this, these are speed groups. I only give them like five or ten minutes to do that. And um, so they have to think short and quick. I have each group tell me, what did your group tend to talk about? And then I would write that on the board. You know, group one focused on this, group two focused on this, group three focused on this. And then I said to them, because I'm asking you what you were interested in, I can now tailor my lecture to your input. In other words, they were teaching me what they want me to teach them by asking the questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I do a variation of that. That's uh, interesting because what I do, especially when I'm teaching Psych 100, is I ask them to take the topic that we're doing because every class has a different topic that we're covering. Psych 100, you have to cover a lot of territory. And I ask them to uh, write a half a page about how they that impacted their life or how they it related to their life. For instance, if you if you take your example of Freud, three three parts of the personality, the uh, the id, the ego, and the superego. I asked them to think about something in their life where uh, their ego was dominant, or their id was dominant, or their superego was at play, and write a, write a half a page about that. And then I had, I would pick uh, students on by random uh, every class to uh, share something. So all the students had to be prepared because they might be the ones that were picked. I'd pick three or four out of the class and they would share it with the other people. And so that gave the other students a look at something different than other people thought of those three parts of Freud's personality. Uh, and it also gave that information to me, like you're talking about. So that interaction, uh, I think, is so important between teacher and student. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciate your example of that because, uh, and like I said, we all teach it slightly differently, but we're all trying to reach, reach out and uh, make this meaningful to the students. Um, let's go back to the thing I talked about earlier uh, that I said we'd return to the fact that uh, we often are inspired ourselves when we are students by teachers. And I was going to ask you if there was a particular teacher or professor that inspired you along the way and then how they inspired you uh, to get sort of more at that, that level of how, how we motivate students? I can think of a couple. Um, I guess the first one that comes to mind is uh, in graduate school, one of the classes that I took was um, um, psychodrama, which was a combination of gestalt therapy and drama, psychodrama. And the uh, the instructor is was actually clinically uh, in major depression. He struggled with it all his life. But you know, as well as I do, with with this with the diagnostic categories, people aren't just there and never come out of it. It's more like they go in and out. So they have times in their life when they when they the symptoms are not so overwhelming, and other times when they're uh, disabled. And this guy, he was so interesting that um, one time he had trouble opening a door to the classroom and he asked me to give him a hand. So I went into a, a make-believe with him. I said, well, that, that handle's really a person and we have to talk to it. And he laughed, he laughed, and he was depressed. He laughed, right? And we had this conversation about opening the door as if it was a person. And I thought, this, this is an interesting instructor that he can get away with that kind of uh, sort of playfulness. Because, you know, when you're, when you're just improvising, you could, you could embarrass yourself when you're improvising because you don't know what's coming next. Um, and uh, 
later I found out that he was so depressed, sometimes he had to take a week or two off. And when he knew he was going into depression, he would give us all postcards with his address on it. And he would say, right when, when, I, when, when I call the school and say I'm depressed and can't teach, write something like nice on there and mail it to me. And so he would get all his different classes. He'd probably get 60 or 70 different postcards that made him feel better. I thought, I thought a teacher can do that. Yeah. Now, and I, now I, I wouldn't want to do that, but the but the I but the idea for me is I could do that on a different way with students. I I could ha I could give them postcards and say, okay, write something, da 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 da. It's already prepaid. I'm going to have to pay for the price of the postcard. That's okay. I'll do that. And. Uh, and then we'll throw them in a hopper and we'll see what everybody said. Anyway, I, so I guess the point here is from that instructor, I really learned how far you can be playful and or out of the ordinary and, and get away with it. And there's other examples, too, but I'm going to be stopped there because I tend to go on too long. That, that's a great example. And uh, one of the things that uh, I tried was very similar to that. Um, I was teaching a, uh, it was a class on uh, actually social psychology uh, and how the different, uh, you know, groups interact together. And uh, my students came from all different kinds of backgrounds and lived in all sorts of different places. So I had them go out and uh, take pictures uh, with their cameras. And if they didn't have a camera, I arranged for the school to, uh, loan them a camera and come back with 10 pictures, 10 pictures that uh, talk to them about their surrounding, that uh, illustrated uh, the influences that they had by their surroundings. Uh, hmm. And uh, it was, you know, it was a great thing, you know, and it got students so geared up to thinking about it, not just reading about it and reflecting data, uh, in that, but uh, actually participating and doing their own research. Um, anytime that I can inspire creativity, like you're talking about in your students, uh, I think that's an incredible plus to uh, to getting across your point. So that was a great example. Thank you. I'm going to rip off what you just said. That's a good idea. I'm going to use it this next semester. <laughs> Photograph thing. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, and of course, I did it a long time ago. This was when I first started teaching graduate students, and uh, I, I can't even, you know, maybe 30 years ago. So uh, nowadays, you can put it on, you know, Zoom like we are, you know, and, uh, you know, or any type of uh, yeah. technology and share it just instantly instead of having yeah. hard copies of it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you'll have to tell me about that and tell me how it turns out. Yeah, a, a, another connection to that is it could, it could, it could be a, a different day if we do another one but the Im the impact of your visual surround your architectural world that you walk around in how does that affect you that's an interesting topic i, I don't we can't we can't go there now because it's not about teaching but um that fascinates me that topic it's like how much beauty do you actually see when you walk your wherever you live your neighborhood do you, is there any, or is it all just big square buildings? How does that affect? I, I'd like to do that. Yeah, and uh, even square buildings can be beautiful, depending upon the type of day and what's happening in them. Uh, there's so many things that you can take a look at. it, And that, of course, dovetails into my major uh, thesis here, is that finding happiness in hard times. And we're certainly in hard times. Okay. And certainly finding those that happiness certainly works. Let's, yeah. uh, let's take that, because we're running a little short now. Uh, let's take that sort of toward the end, because I wanted to talk about the fact that teaching is always changing. It's always evolving. So the teaching that uh, we started off doing many years ago, uh, we've changed uh, the way we way we do things, and teaching itself has changed. So I was wondering uh, your opinions on how teaching is going to change in the next 20, 10 or 20 years. Uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen to education? A lot of people are asking that. How do we educate people more? Because 
you know, if the latest data is anything, we're not doing so well from the student scores in a number of areas. So how can we change for the better? Or how, you know, might we change? Plus, uh, the thing I'm most interested in is not only how it's going to change in reality, but how you would hope it would change, what you would like to see in the future for teaching. You've just given me a Zen paradox. Um, I don't I don't have a good look of what's coming for teaching. Sorry, I know this is about joy of teaching, but I see the I see AI as eventually getting rid of teachers and uh, it will be able to teach way better than we can in terms of facts. I really believe that. Um, I think way back when Skinner was starting, he got a classroom full of simple computers and every time they took a, a, a test and got the right answer, they got a little praise or a toy or a candy or something like that. And it was really obvious how that would manipulate learning not to learn anything, but to try to get the right answer for the goodie. And uh, I, I think once AI gets in and we're gone, Here's here's the only nice thing I can say. I'm sorry. The only nice thing I can say is I do think that students will probably learn more information because the AI can direct it, like fine tune it to the most nth level of learning. But I don't define education as learning. I define I define the ultimate goal as wisdom, and without interaction with people because you're gonna wind up being with people uh, and learning how hard it is to talk about opinions that maybe people don't agree with. And you know, uh, the growth the growth that happens when you have to go through all, all the struggle. That's where the wisdom comes in. And so the best thing I say, can say is I think scores would improve and I think wisdom would not. I know that's not leaving on a happy note, but that's my perception. <laughs> Well, I'm much more an optimist than Greg. I know you are. <laughs> so I would, I would, I would uh, change that around. Uh, and I Please agree do. with I, I agree with AI the fact that it teaches facts and it will teach you better, you know, uh, more co comprehensive information right. about your field about anything that's happening. It will teach you the data. But what is needed? I don't think teachers are going to go away because I think what's going to happen is you're going to be divided into education that deals with facts and data and all that sort of stuff. But then the next level after that is what we would call a practicum, where students actually have to put that information that they've gotten from AI into practice. And in psychology, and both uh, Greg and I are psychology teachers, uh, that has to mean that they have to deal with uh, patients, with clients, uh, with people who are needing some help. And that sort of thing without a real person that you're using that data to, to do your therapy without that interaction with real people, uh, it's not gonna be all that, I, I don't think you can replace that. So I think we're just gonna go to a different level. The teachers are gonna sort of migrate to the uh, on hands level and uh, a, a, application, applying that education to actually doing. And I think that uh, certainly that would, happen in music, you know, and I wish we had time to talk about the music because it's one thing to learn notes and learn compositions and everything, but to be able to get up and do the music, and again, you know, uh, special kudos to Tina Turner, who was wonderful, and all the musicians that have given us so much joy over the years. Um, to do that, especially in uh, with other people, like a band or, you know, whether it's big, big or small, that's a whole different area that I don't think AI is going to be able to teach you about that. So hopefully uh, that's the optimistic part of the future. And we've sort well, of run out of time. So, yeah. well, let me just say thank you. You've given me a ray of hope. Because <laughs> I agree. If you could move it to the practicum, you could maybe have the best of both worlds. Yeah. And, uh, and I hope that we're uh, around there to have enjoy that practicum type of thing, because it would be a relief to... Uh, to give other people, including AI, the uh, you know the task of just data producing and data transfer over, sure. so we could stick to actually doing some stuff in the real world. So, great stuff. Thanks, Greg, for being with us. Uh, 
always a pleasure to have you on the show and uh, thanks for sharing your expertise. Thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody who's in the audience. We appreciate you being there and I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks to Think Tech Hawaii, uh, Jay and Haley and Michael and Ash and all those people who make this possible by doing the, the technology uh, and uh, making it so we don't look quite so bad on the, on the screen. Now, <laughs> I hope you'll all join me in uh, two weeks, same time, same, uh, you know, same area. And uh, we'll be with you then. And uh, we're, we got a very special thing happening in two weeks. And that is that uh, finding happiness in hard times is going to start looking at not only joy, but big questions. Uh, because I think that we need to look at big questions if we're going to actually be happy. A lot of times we avoid those big questions um, until they come and hit us in the head, like COVID did, for instance. Uh, so, uh, you know, and how do we protect ourselves? How do we stay healthy? That type of thing. So I've got three people coming in in two weeks who are brilliant and in very many different fields and are going to talk to us about the first big question that we'll tackle. And that big question is, what is important? I'll leave you with that so you can think about it. See you in two weeks. Thanks for being with us. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.